San Antonio, it appeared as though Jamal Murray had forgotten how to shoot, which doesn't happen a lot to NBA players. He was just 8 of 31 until he made up for it in the fourth game, two scoring 21 of his 24 in that final quarter in the Nuggets' comeback to avoid an 0-2 hole. Ahead of tonight's game three, Murray talked about recognizing and overcoming the moment. I think in the fourth quarter, I just took a look around. I took a look at you know, where I was, the towels waving, um, the score, the time, the quarter, and uh, I made the most of it. I just went out there and played. and uh, I stood From the moment I made my first shot, the crowd was up on their feet. So that's where I felt it, where you know, everybody's looking, looking forward to me to get going. You know, everybody's looking at somebody to get going. And I uh, made my first two, and um, at that point, everybody knew you know, it was, uh, was going to be a, a good quarter for me and for the team. And our team was picked up, and the fans were back in. And uh, you know, I'm to come up with the W. Uh, he may have changed the series. What, what, what does this mean for the rest of the games moving forward that Jamal Murray is Jamal Murray again? Yeah, for him, as, as we all know, as young guys going into the playoffs for the first time, confidence is huge. So now the first couple games, actually the first like seven quarters, <laughs> his confidence was low because he hadn't made a shot. But now he, he hits big shots. He goes on a 21-point fourth quarter. His confidence is there now. So, you know, obviously for them moving forward, you want Jamal Murray being at his best, shooting, feeling confident, making the right plays, unafraid of the next moment. Because, you know, in the playoffs, you may get missed four or five shots. But they still need him to take his shots. So I think moving forward, the biggest thing for, for Jamal Murray is he has his confidence back. Oh. I think for me, Jamal Murray is their best one-on-one -on -one guy. Um, and so the fact that he got off in that quarter and the fact that, you know, he's starting to see the game and starting to slow down for him, that's dangerous for San Antonio. Um, Denver's a huge assist team. They move the ball, they pass the ball. But once they get late in the shot clock, especially in tight games, if they can give the ball to Jamal Murray and say, hey, young fella, go get us a bucket, that's going to be tough for, for uh, San Antonio to defend. Nuggets also found their pace in game two, zero fast break points in game one, 21 in game two. Does that, does that travel to Texas? Well, it'll be tough. Obviously, San Antonio will, will try to, you know, adjust to that and do a better job of getting back in transition. And, Matt, most of them, obviously, here was a live ball turnover. But a lot of those transition baskets were off of just, you know, rebounds, defensive right. rebounds and getting out and running. So San Antonio, uh, a team that has struggled at times this year with transition defense, that'll be a point of emphasis. But that's what kept them in the game because most of those transition baskets happened before Jamal Murray got hot there in that fourth quarter. Right. So... Uh, yes, continue to push the tempo. It's going to be harder to do on the road. Uh, and, and 21 fast break points, which is something they're not really accustomed to doing throughout the regular season, um, will be difficult. But yeah, easy baskets before that defense gets set, set up is going to be imperative for a Golden, or excuse me, for Denver on the road. Spurs didn't help themselves in the fourth quarter either. They only turned it over 10 times for the game, but four of those were during that comeback for the Denver Nuggets. Well, the road team usually feels good about a split in the higher seeded team city in games one and two. That's just the way these things work, right? You want to get the split. It's especially true now that the series arrives in San Antonio. Denver and the Spurs have lopsided home road splits. The Nuggets are tied with Philly for the worst road record among top four seeds, while the Spurs were one of just five teams league-wide to lose fewer than 10 times at home. And in fact, Denver has lost 13 straight in San Antonio. They haven't won a game there since 2012, so <laughs> they've got all that baggage in addition to what they've put on the plane. No, I think for them, they need to get out and run early. Get out, get stops, and run early. Establish the pace. Even if it's uncomfortable for you, it's going to be way more uncomfortable for San Antonio. And I think after the last game, you want to play on those emotions early, show them that you still have the confidence from last game and that you're focused and ready to go, especially early, um, especially to, to quell that San Antonio uh, crowd. You'll see that game three right here on NBA TV, tip just after 9 Eastern time. More coming up here in the meantime. Sixers and Nets coming up at the top of the hour. On TNT, that's Joel Embiid, who figures to be public enemy number one tonight in Brooklyn. Well, I like that. Ooh, you, that. See, hey. you see the <laughs> word done? You know what I'm saying? Ben Simmons getting ready to go tonight for the 76ers. He's in the half court right now. Some would say that makes him an average player. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Even that's in warm-ups. Ooh. That's fire. Ooh. Some, some have said that. Bang, bang. That's friendly. Sixers disagree. <laughs> Game three coming up tonight. On TNT, Greg Anthony is standing by in Brooklyn to call game three on TNT. Uh, GA, when the uh, grievances become public the way they have in this series over the last couple of days, how will it affect things on the court tonight, uh, including how the referees might approach this game? 
Well, I, I think this is going to be a pretty physical game, as physical as we'll see in the modern NBA. Uh, I, I felt like Philly came out and punched Brooklyn in the mouth, and, and they didn't handle it well, especially in that third quarter. Uh, but I think you'll see Brooklyn try to respond. The question, though, is Brooklyn's not a physical team by nature. They're, they're a bit more of a skilled team. They like to get up and down. So I don't think they want to overplay their hand and get out of character. Uh, but I do think this game, in a lot of ways, I, I think is a must win. Because if you're Philly, you don't want to give a young Nets team confidence that they could actually win the series. And, and if they come out and win game three, that's what happens. And, and if, you're, if you're Brooklyn, this is an opportunity for you to keep home court and put that pressure on Philly. Everybody knows all the speculations about whether or not Brett Brown's going to be back, what personnel coming back as well when you look at Philly. So this is a monumental game for the Sixers here on the road. Greg, this is Grant. Hey, I just want to know, you obviously, playoffs all about adjustments. And I thought in game two, Philly did a good job on D'Angelo Russell. They really harassed him. They even at times put Ben Simmons on him, give him a different look with their length. Any talk with the Brooklyn coaching staff and, and the folks there just about what adjustments they may make to get D'Angelo Russell going like he did in game one? Grant, I think it's a great point. I think they got a little bogged down. You know, they got too much into the one-on-one -on -one play. If you look at the numbers, they had 27 assists in game one on 40% shooting. That, that's an amazing number when you look at how poorly they shot the ball. Game two, they shot 47%, but they only had 20 assists. So that tells you that they were much more ISO-oriented, which I think bodes well for Philly. Philly's long. Uh, they're not the quickest team. And so if you play more ISO basketball against them and you play later in the shot clock, their size becomes an advantage. Brooklyn's a team, a fifth of their points come the first five seconds of the shot clock. And then over half their points come in the pick and roll. So I think you're going to look for them to play faster and you're going to look for them to be more involved in that pick and roll game because that's been their recipe for success against the Sixers. Hey, Greg, this is uh, Channing Fry. If you are Philly, right, how do you put pressure on uh, Brooklyn to get the ball in the post? Have they talked about feeding and be more early and often? Yes, it, Channing, that's a, a great point. And listen, they are just a markedly different team when Joel Embiid is engaged early and often. And, and I, listen, he's their best player. They have to play through him inside out. Game one, he settled, I thought, a lot more for perimeter shots. Didn't have two feet in the paint enough. That wasn't the case in game two. And I think you're going to see more of that. The reality is Brooklyn does not have an answer for Joel Embiid unless he bails them out by settling for threes and jump shots. When he makes up his mind, I'm going to play inside out, I think Philly becomes a much more dangerous team offensively and creates far more problems for the Nets. Hey, Jay, what's up? It's Booz. How you doing, man? What's up, Big Booz? Doing good. Hey, question about Brooklyn. Who do you think is going to be the X factor for them to come in, give those starters a, a big lift, a, a boost to help them get this, this game three win? You know, they typically do it by committee off their bench, but mm -hmm. a, a guy I'm looking at who's a barometer for me is Joe Harris. I, I think he's a guy, because of his ability to shoot it, that if he's having an impact on the game, their offense seems to flow better. So I, I'm going to be watching him early. Listen, their strength is their bench, but I do think they need to make a statement early in the game, and oftentimes the three-point shot has become the momentum shot. Spencer Dinwiddie's going to have to play well coming off the bench, but in that starting five, someone other than D'Angelo Russell has to have an impact, and oftentimes shooting plays a pivotal role, and I think Harris is a guy that somehow, some way, has got to get going, much like we saw with J.J. Redick in game two. Greg Anthony with us from Brooklyn and rocking the turtleneck tonight ahead of game three on <laughs> TNT. It's cold here. It's cold in with Brooklyn. With that Carolina blue jacket, too. Uh, we no, see no, you. We no, see no, you. No, that's, that's, not blue that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. Georgetown got gray and blue in it, too, though. Okay. A lot of folks there reading in a lot of signals from Greg Anthony. Uh, ben Simmons, fairly pedestrian by his standards in game one. A triple-double in the game two route. And perhaps not coincidentally, Jared Dudley, Spent about 20 possessions guarding him in game one, giving up just two points while Dudley missed game two with a calf injury. And of course, as you know by now, he said between games that Simmons is, quote, an average player in the half court, great in transition. So what can the Nets do defensively to make that so tonight? Well, Jared Dudley talks a lot, but there's some truth in the sense that he is great in transition. So transition defense is a must. Brooklyn, you got to get back. You got to form a wall. 
Simmons is so good and he's so long. Once he gets his foot in the paint, consider it a layup. So, Matt, let's say you're coming out and guarding me here. Obviously, I'm not a shooter. You don't want him to just get a full head of steam coming downhill. So a little, you know, look, staying close, but not, you know, not too close. But it's certainly backing up as Simmons goes. And then the defenders obviously want to be close enough. Philly's not a great three-point shooting team. So you can form a wall. I like to say there should be five sets of eyeballs on Simmons when he has the ball and he's going downhill. And there's enough time as he's going. He tried, there's no lanes there. You could still get out to a shooter if he passes out to a shooter. So forming that wall, getting back, making sure he doesn't get into the paint. Because once he gets in the paint, one dribble in the paint, and he's so long, and he can get to the rim with ease. What's the appropriate amount of space for a guy like that? You want to encourage him to shoot if you can, but you don't want to let him get ahead of steam. I think you have to play the game. I think you have to stop his momentum, especially in transition, but put your toes on a three-point line and send him to the worst shooter. J.J. Redick is generally going to be on this side. You want to send him this way because Joel Embiid is going to be on this end. If you send him to his right hand, you have lesser shooters on this side. You have Jimmy and Tobias. I think they're great. They're not generally three-point shooters like that. What, let's say he does beat you. Now you have your big man, Jared Allen, and people to drop back and box out Embiid on, on a short weak side. Oh, well said. I mean, I think at the end of the day, you want, to, you want to force him to shoot jump shots, but also have the wall so he can't get in the lane. Make other guys beat you, which is what you want to do. You don't want, you don't want to have him getting layups and dunks in transition and being able to feed everybody else. And, no. one, and one other thing, too. Once he's out of transition in the half court, I play way off him. Oh, way yeah. Embarrass him into shooting the basketball. Yeah, absolutely. You know what? He, you know, he has the ball up top. I'd be right there in the paint. Make him shoot it. Make him, make him beat you from outside. Right. He shot 21% from mid-range during the regular season. So there's, there's something to that's, that's 21% strategy. better than me right now. And, <laughs> <laughs> and one more thing, he can't make free throws. There's that factor as well. More coming up here, Lou Williams. Swing, swing. And his benchmate, Montrez Harrell, were huge in the game two comeback against Golden State. Find out how their chemistry predates their time oh, with the Clippers. Deck. <laughs> this jacket's too tight, man. <laughs> European cut.